Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive methods of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. If you like the video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you will be notified when future videos are posted. We also would appreciate it if you can make a tax-deductible donation to support our mission of providing stress-free dog education and resources. A link to donate is in the description below along with links to our website and other resources to stress-free training. Enjoy the webinar. Hi, my name is Amy Glasgow. I am the owner and head trainer of Oscar Winning Behavior where we work with both cat and dog behavior modification near Baltimore, Maryland and online. I'm recognized through the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants as a certified dog behavior consultant and also as the first accredited dog trainer in Maryland. I'm also a certified separation anxiety trainer and a fun scent games instructor. I wanna thank your dog's friend for having me here today to talk about one of my favorite topics, multi-pet homes. As someone who has always had both cats and dogs and for whom it's very important that I'm able to continue to have both. This is a subject near and dear to my heart. Uh, if you have any questions about the presentation, please feel free to enter them into the chat and then we'll get to them at the end. Thanks. The specific exercises that I will be talking about today are focused towards dogs and cats. Um, those are my specialties. However, if you're here for information about other species, the general concepts are the same. For example, I've done a little bit about pigs and cohabitating with other species. You're just gonna need to make some adaptations for your species. Those changes are gonna be mostly about specific motivators. You probably wouldn't use roast beef for a bunny reward, for example. Um, other adjustments to keep them comfortable, such as leashing restraints and that sort of thing. You'll wanna think about natural enrichment and habitat requirements for each species and plan for that, such as the predator or prey animal instincts and things along those lines. I also want to quickly say that just as there should be no shame in ending a romantic relationship because it just isn't a good fit, we shouldn't be afraid to allow relationships between pets to end. We might do that through crate and rotate in which individual pets are kept entirely separate from each other in separate rooms or areas of the home and come out at individual times for family time. The one who's away is given alone appropriate enrichment and is probably napping anyway, and the one who's out is getting training and affection and social exposure, and then it rotates. However, if there's danger for the pets, if management is difficult to maintain, kids don't close doors ever, really, um, anything like that, there should be no shame in rehoming. I like to point out to people, I liked my husband right away, but it took me five years to actually marry him. And yet we often expect people to make 10 to 15 year commitments for pets after a five minute meeting in a busy municipal building. It's okay to realize that those five minutes weren't the most clear and perfect setup and to find a better fit for everyone involved. That said, I do find there is great value in having multiple pets. So let's talk about the ways we can make that happen with success. These methods can work for first time introductions to set everyone off on the right foot and can also be effective for starting over once there's been a problem. The bad news when there's been a problem already is that each of these steps will probably take longer because we're not starting with neutral, we're having to repair some bad feelings. But the good news is we know more. We have more information about each animal so we can really fine tune what they like and don't like and how to make things more enjoyable for them. Either way, whether we're starting off fresh or starting over from an accident, we want to prepare. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. So you're going to want to be sure you have baby gates that work for various areas of your home, as well as places where each animal can hide if they need to escape. Don't forget, cats think vertically as well as horizontally. So cat trees to climb or things to hide under are very important when we're dealing with cats. I like to have success stations set up 
and that's a, a plan so that if things go sideways during any training sessions, you know which animal is getting grabbed and by who, you know where they're going. And in that area are food toys and other high value enrichment to make that quick separation more pleasant for them. Now, who grabs which animal might be who has the better bond, but it might just be a matter of might. For example, in my house, I have a 45 pound dog and a 90 pound dog. And if there was an issue between them, you better believe my husband is grabbing the 90 pounder. He's a whole lot stronger than I am, both the husband and the dog. So <laughs> in your home, it could be the same kind of a thing. You, you might even set up a plan where once a month or so, you check those areas to make sure that the supplies are still stocked, that doors still close securely, that you haven't moved a lamp or a piece of furniture or anything that would change any kind of uh, safety setups. You can even set a reminder to check, say, the day you do heartworm meds or something like that. Also, if there are multiple people in the home, you may want to have assignments posted on the fridge so that people can see their role frequently. And there's no debating whose job is what. Uh, also remember, if you do have a dog fight, you probably have more time than you think. It feels like everything is immediate, but you almost always have time to sort of center yourself and take a breath and make sure you're following the plan rather than just panicking, even if panic is completely natural. <laughs> the more prepared and practiced you feel, the better you will be at responding to those scary situations. So try and keep that in mind. I know that's a bummer, but I always try and start my sessions talking about this yucky stuff and then everyone feels prepared and has that in their mind. Then we spend the rest of the time training to avoid that need. If you have one barrier between the animals, they're going to burst through, they just are. Cats and dogs and well darn near everything else are far, far faster than humans. So you wanna have what we call an airlock. Think of every space movie you've ever seen that has one doorway from the ship to the dock and then another from the dock to the main hold. Every barrier has a backup. How you make those backups can vary a whole lot depending on your needs. However, you do wanna be sure that the restraints don't bring stress themselves. So if you're using anything physical like a harness or a crate, especially with cats, you wanna train it separately and be sure that those things have positive feelings on their own. You can use tethers too, and some people will just screw those into the baseboards of their homes, but a lot of other people can't, whether that's through rental restrictions or construction of their home or even just their own handyman limitations. So I have a very simple tutorial on my website, oscarwinningbehavior.com, for a great tether you can make for a very few dollars. You can actually make several for under $20. And you can use it as long as you have a door or even with smaller animals, heavy furniture. The address is there on your screen right now, um, but you can also find it in the notebook section on my website, which has a lot of other articles and such. This is another one of those times when you're going to want to take species into account, trying to consider the animal's ability to get through small holes and uh, over, over gates and things like that. While we're talking about restraints, uh, I think muzzles are a great idea. Again, you need to properly train them. So um, the dogs need to have positive feelings about them, which can happen even if they've had bad feelings in the past. But when you use them, you wanna make sure they're very positively conditioned. I often find the owners struggle with this as well. And I encourage you to think of it as a treat basket rather than envisioning your sweet baby caged up like Hannibal Lecter. When done properly, the dog really will be eager to put it on and the appearance usually bothers people far more than it bothers the dogs. You wanna make sure that it's comfortable, properly fitted with plenty of room for the dog to pant and receive treats, which means those super tight nylon ones many general vets use are not a good idea here. Those are meant for very short wear in emergencies and for vet exams, not for extended training sessions. 
the goal of those is exclusively to prevent bites, not to keep the dog comfortable or to build positive feelings about the experience. In any event, muzzles limit the damage that can be inflicted if the dog actually gets to the other animal. Our goal in this training is to not allow them to get closer than we're ready for. So they're great to have as backup in case of human error or other system failures, but I personally do not count them in one of the two restraints when I'm talking about that airlock that I mentioned earlier. So as I said, these methods can be applied if you're introducing two animals or if you're starting over after a problem. If you've ever adopted an animal, you've probably told, been told one of two things, either two weeks shutdown, which suggests the animal needs two weeks with very few, if any, demands placed upon them, no training, minimal walks, no new excursions, new people, that sort of thing. You might have also heard the rule of threes, which suggests that three days, three weeks, and three months are sort of benchmarks in the new pet's comfort level in your home. I hate to break it to everyone, but both of these concepts are generally pipe dreams. It is impossible to determine how long it's going to take your pet to settle in based on some arbitrary timeline. It's going to depend on the activity in your individual home combined with the individual pet and their own resilience and confidence levels. So I like the guidelines for reminding people that it takes time. I think that's important but I also think it can give a false hope about how much time we're talking about. I have a cat in my home that I brought home when his mom rejected him when he was about a week old. I moved from a flat single level home to my split level where I am now when he was about six. It took him two years to come downstairs in the new home. That was okay with me. He was happy upstairs. He had what he needed. He would socialize with the family when we were up there. He was fine. He was just a little bit more of a hermit than those rules would suggest. In fact, if, if any of you have taken any virtual consults with me, he's the one that greets you for all of our online sessions. So you've seen him, you know he's fine. Instead of trying to assign time limits, to when an animal should adjust. I instead refer to the alien behind the door dance. You were wondering what that little guy in the corner has to do with anything, right? <laughs> what that means is when we bring our new animal home or when we restrict two animals from each other after they've had a problem, they often sort of hyper fixate on the enclosure where the other animal is. They're constantly sniffing at the door frame or any air leaks in the barrier being really concerned if you go in and out of the room and being hyper aware of any noises made in there, sort of a, there's something in there and I must defend the home front from it. When they've settled down, when they're completely non-reactive and comfortable with the sounds and smells coming from that area, that is when the alien behind the door dance has concluded. So the dance is done, take a bow. I appreciate your coming. Thanks again to your dog's friend. Just kidding. Sorry, it's, it's not quite that easy. Now that both animals are calm and no longer alerting us to rogue aliens, our goal is to keep them at this state of normalcy and relaxation. So still keeping the animals separate, we wanna start blending their worlds a little bit. You can take bedding or uh, toys or anything odor rich like harnesses from one pet and swap it with the other pet's goodies. In the beginning, you might wanna just work those things in the same room, but not really force exposure, but you can work towards things like putting a food bowl on top of the bedding so that they smell it as they're eating and toss some extra yummy treats on it as well common question I get here is, will that make them think they should be eating the other animal? No, it, it won't. What it does is tell the pet that the odor of the other animal is related to homey feelings like meals and nap times and toys. It's basically classical conditioning. When that odor is around, so are other good things. And there's no threat 
involved. If the animals have to see each other at all for potty breaks or things like that, every exposure should include the highest value treats you can manage while keeping a safe and generous distance. And once the animals can exchange all that information without stress, when they aren't obviously obsessively sniffing the bedding of the stranger and instead just take it as part of the world, then we teach the animals to relax. So much like with human meditation, we found that when we reward animals for outwardly expressive postures, their minds can and will eventually follow suit. And also like human meditation, this takes practice and is virtually impossible to learn in a busy, scary, or stressful setting. So get into that, that superhero pose. Remember that you learned a few years back and tell yourself, you can do this. You're gonna wanna take each dog and teach them this skill privately in a quiet area with you modeling relaxed behavior. So get yourself comfortable, slouch, use a quiet voice if you need to speak to them. You can start with them on a comfy mat or a soft bed and the treats you use should not be too exciting themselves. I like those, um, those little crackers, the, the Charlie Bears, or even dry milk bones, something like that. This is not usually a time for real meat or cheese, which you rarely hear me say. Gradually increase distractions and introduce new locations. Don't have them near the other pet until they know what this exercise is. Now listen, this exercise is super simple to the point you're gonna feel silly even trying it because how could something this easy be this effective, but I promise you it is. You can do it for less than five minutes at a time to see progress. This is video of two very different dogs. One is a border of mine and the other is my own little girl in their very first time learning the protocol, which is my own variant of Suzanne Clothier's really real relaxation exercise. This was filmed outside. There's no um, words, there's no spoken words in the exercise, but you may hear just sort of outdoor noises.
as you're watching this, take a note of how much this dog, this is my girl, how much she's wiggling, her tail is wagging. Um, she's trying to get closer to Heather because she really likes Heather. Um, all of that activity that's going on and watch all of that slow down during the progression of this exercise, which while you're doing it feels like about 47 years, but is actually really only a very few minutes. I have a cute dog. All right, once the animal is a pro at relaxing on their own, to the point that you get into the position to do the exercise yourself and the animal just flops in front of you comfortably, 
then you can bring the other animal into view and you're going to want to start at a distance because as i said your goal is to never change how relaxed the animals feel so if you need to go outside and start with two dogs feel free to do so you might even set up a cat in a windowsill and a dog outside if that's what you need to do to get distance if distance is uh, impossible get as much distance as you can and use higher value treats then. That's something that can keep the animal's attention while they're in the presence of the other creature. And while you definitely still want to double up on those security measures like gates and leashes and crates, etc., the goal again is to keep animals calm enough so that hopefully none of that is ever needed. When both animals are as calm as possible, do another session or two at that distance and then decrease by like a foot at a time. Slow decreases. When one animal stands up to move closer, the other should be showered in treats. Movement is a big trigger and we're gonna address that in a bit. For now though, any movement from animal A means tons of treats for animal B. So seriously, double up on the safety. Puppies and kittens have spastic little blurbs of reckless abandon. Kittens in particular jump and climb as do a lot of other animals. A gate will probably not contain a kitten or a ferret or something similar. So you're going to want to look into crating for them. That means just like you've been practicing the relaxation protocol with the animal alone and away from other stressors, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the crate is a positive experience as well. And that it doesn't mean being held out before some giant predator 10 times their size with no chance of escape, right? You're gonna to wanna to check frequently on anyone who's created and make sure that crating is in itself a positive experience. You can use bits of real chicken or other goodies, uh, frequent breaks to make sure stress doesn't occur just from the restraint. Training sessions should really be pretty short anyway, usually under five or 10 minutes. But if more frequent breaks are needed, take them. All right, once everyone can be in fairly close quarters and remain relaxed, it's time to start moving slowly, very, very slowly. Remember how we got closer by giving the still friend lots of treats. The same thing's gonna happen here. You're gonna stand up and go one step at a time. And then if everybody stays calm, you're gonna go two steps and then three steps and then gradually a slow but consistent walk. If anyone gets stressed, like any muscle tension or sitting up beyond just looking at the movement, slow down again. This is admittedly easier to do when you've got two dogs who can hold a down position. But if you're having a dog get used to living with cats, you can use small teaser toys like the long ribbons and move them slowly so that the cat begins to sort of wave a paw at them or maybe takes one hop before catching it while the dog stays relaxed and gradually increase the movement of the toy. Remember, we're always taking the comfort of both learners into account here. So you want to go at a pace that's comfortable for both dog and cat. And if you're using toys with the cat, never use later laser pointers when the dog can see them. You can also introduce pattern games at this point to help establish movement in comfortable ways. Pattern games are a collection of exercises developed by Leslie McDevitt that teach animals set, you guessed it, patterns that help them deal with unusual situations. If 2020 taught us anything, it's that the unexpected can be terrifying. Pattern games give the animals something familiar, a, a rhythm, if you will, to fall back on when something unexpected happens. And that helps them find comfort in a difficult time. There are literally dozens, and you can even make up your own, but one of my favorites is Super Bowls, and I use it for a lot of multi-pet situations. You're going to take five or six targets, 
the number really doesn't matter and, and can actually vary quite a bit. And as originally, as the name would suggest, the targets were originally food bowls. I use paper plates a lot because so many people have them around, but even scraps of paper will work. It's just a visual target that you and the animal can see is your next stop in the pattern. So you'll lay them out starting in a line about two feet apart. And then the animal can look all over the place, but when they make eye contact with you, you step up to the plate and put a bit of food on it. The animal eats that and again, looks around and does whatever they want until they make eye contact with you. And then you move to the next plate and put a bit of food on that. So you get into that rhythm of eye contact, plate, eat. Eye contact, plate, eat. Just like the relaxation protocol, you're gonna to wanna to do this with the animal alone first so they can learn that game and pattern. And then when you have the other animal around, the bowls actually become cues that this game is taking place. This is one of the reasons I like this game because the visual of the bowls is an immediate cue for the dog that this comfortable thing is going on. You're just gonna move back and forth along the line of targets, which means your pace is fairly controlled. There's stopping and starting and it's very comfortable and low pressure for everyone. You'll notice at no time are the animals told not to look at each other or actually in any way given any reprimands. I want them to think when that other guy is around, life is good, not possibly interpret anything I say as when that guy's around, I get in trouble. On this slide, you'll notice I've used Super Bowls in two different ways here. The white shepherd on the right has a nemesis whose yard he passes on walks. We use Super Bowls to help him feel comfortable with that. So you'll notice the gate and the leash are the, our two forms of safety here. In very little time, he could walk comfortably past the yard without concern for the other dog. When, when we started this exercise, he was pulling and trying to get through the gate to try and get to the other dog. The brown dog on the bottom left was not consulted before his family adopted a kitten. He really wanted to chase that kitten. So we worked with relaxation in the home for a while, and this is actually several steps into Super Bowls where the kitten is enjoying toys and chicken breast in his little crate. The crate is at the bottom left of the picture there. Um, the side effect of this is that the kitten is gonna be really easy to crate when he has to go to the vet and uh, needs to be moved around and things like that. At first we started with the dog in a pattern parallel to the kitten. So he wasn't getting closer or farther away. He was just moving back and forth. And then as you can see in this picture, we made it perpendicular. So he does get closer and further away from the kitten. The whole time he's on an entirely loose leash. The kitten was checked on very frequently and given breaks when needed. And mostly the animals appear pretty unconcerned with each other. That's the goal here. We want them both to be okay that the other guy is there. So in both of these pictures, the animals had not actually had altercations with each other. They were just sort of excited by the existence of the other animal. In this case though, we have a pit bull named Precious and a three-legged Jack Russell mix named Apple, whose parents have been dating for a while. These two dogs have gotten into fights, sometimes over food and some other things. Um, they couldn't always tell what the trigger was. The fights were relatively minor, thankfully, but now mom and dad want to move in together and they're a little bit worried. So this lovely couple has been working with me for a year now. I actually went into their homes back in the olden days when we were reckless and laissez-faire and just went into buildings willy-nilly. They're hoping to move in together this summer. So they actually planned for a year and a half to get things right. And they're doing really, really, really well. So proud of them for how much care they're putting into this. Here's an example of both dogs each doing their own game of Super Bowls. You can't quite see them. There's small targets on the ground that the camera doesn't pick up. So let's watch this video, which is about eight sessions into their work. The benefits of these dots, and one of the reasons I bought them is they're bright and easy for you to see. So good, weigh her out. 
Yes, that was really good. So Press looked at Apple a couple of times, like, what's she doing? But she's not overly worried. She's got something super chewy. Would you give her chewing gum? <laughs> Good, good, nicely done. Yeah, so the shorter grass is easier for Apple. So you may go to a place where there's pavement until Apple really understands. She's starting to get it though. Good. And again, what I like about this is they're doing dog stuff. They're moving around, they're, but they're not fixated on each other. It's a great game to play and you can practice it on your own without the other dog. But when they're living together, it's not going to be about you guys sitting there 24 seven, ready to treat them every time they glance at the other dog. So we want to get them to the point where they're like, yeah, she's walking around. It's okay. One of the ways you could make this even more challenging, and this is not an inside thing because they think you'd need more space, is put those dots further apart and have Apple weaving in and out of the pattern while pressure's going up and down the line. So that again, Apple crosses right in front of her. There's not any treats on the ground because you don't put it down until uh, until Presh says she's ready for you to. So it's not like there's that threat there. That was lovely. But you could go to a park and have just one string of targets and have them be far enough apart that Apple is working up here, weaving around and pressures all the way down there, but still is crossing so it's not just parallel. Make sense? Yeah, yeah now Apple gets it. There we go. <laughs> the light went on. Yeah. Yeah, and the dogs like this. And one of the things they like about it is the level of control they have. What they're learning is I make this game happen by connecting with you. So Presh and Apple are like, look how well I trained my person. Good. I love that family. So a good rule of thumb to remember is DNA. That's the closer the distance, the greater the number, the higher the activity of what makes the pets nervous, the harder time they will have adjusting, the more difficult that situation is gonna be. So if any one of those categories becomes more challenging, the other two have to get easier in order for the difficulty to stay the same. Again, you cannot go too slow. If you have any doubt at all, frankly, even if you don't, slow down. You can easily go too fast and set yourself back quite a bit. And that's even if no one gets hurt, but you cannot go too slow. You wanna only change one aspect of DNA at a time whenever possible and go in slow, small increments. Multiple animals are harder than singles. Multiple animals that move are a lot harder than singles that hold still. And multiple animals that move and get closer or farther away are really, really hard. You cannot go too slow. You can go too fast. Don't assume that an animal moving farther away is less threatening and easier to handle. Remember, both cats and dogs are predators and the instinct to chase is strong literally what keeps them alive. This very short video has Asher, who was a student in my reactive dog class, practicing relaxation while score plays, I'm old and don't care, I'm not gonna fetch it anyway, <laughs> nearby. Please note, while score is obviously off leash, Asher actually has on two leashes attached by two separate means 
So if any bit of equipment there fails, there's still something there keeping him from getting to score. Of course, we don't need it here because look at how great he does. It did take some time to work up to this, obviously, but he rocked it. Bring it back. Good boy. Resources are a big deal. I'm not sure why so many people feel like dogs should share food bowls or eat right next to each other, but literally from day one of their existence, they're taught that they need to compete for food. 10 puppies, eight nipples, day one. It is very basic, natural behavior to resource guard. By the way, humans do it too. And it also matters who's competing for those resources. Again, just like it does with humans. So if my husband or my daughter tried to take a French fry from my plate, I probably wouldn't mind too much. If a stranger walked up to me and did it, I would be mortified. And I might even react violently if it was something more valuable to me. Likewise, I expect the dogs of my family to be okay with our human family members taking dangerous things from them if they're chewing inappropriately. I wouldn't necessarily expect them to be okay with a total stranger doing that. And to carry even further, my two dogs are capable of passing some toys back and forth between them with minimal grumbling. But we have one specific toy on our house, Elphaba's Monkey, and that is for Elfie play only in a specific room because she will throw down for that monkey. That's fair. She's allowed to do that, so we keep it from happening. When you're just getting to know pets or if you're introducing new toys or food, take your time before assuming that they're okay sharing. Play with new toys individually if needed or introduce them with the dogs at a distance or in separate rooms. And don't leave them unsupervised with resources until you know everyone well and know how they can handle things. When you are at the point of letting the animals play, and it's all right if that's months or longer down the road, remember that healthy play is very balanced. There are a lot of breaks, even just for a split second at a time, and there's a lot of give and take. There shouldn't be a clear winner or loser, and both animals should seem happy and be willing to engage. Don't trust a wagging tail. Look at the whole body language. And don't be afraid to call them away or interrupt play yourself. In my experience, playing cats don't tend to make a lot of noise or vocalize much, but growls or yowls do mean business from cats. Dogs, on the other hand, often growl in play. So you're going to need to look for tension in the rest of the body and look at the other dog to see how the other dog is taking it until you feel comfortable translating those growls yourself. You can limit how much play can go on by time or by energy level and should definitely be extra cautious of unsupervised time. With the two dogs in my house I have right now, it took us a solid six months before we would allow them to play off leash in our backyard, even though we would allow play in our living room. See, the living room meant we could reach them quickly, which we couldn't necessarily do if they were outside. It also meant we tended to have them tone down the energy so we wouldn't, you know, lose a couch in the process. It took us a lot longer than six months to let them play off leash in the backyard without us there. And even now, four years later, we do still interrupt and bring them in, in if we hear signs of tension. Um, I have one temperamental little girl and a younger but bigger one who likes to play obnoxious little brother and push her buttons. They generally manage themselves quite well, but I'm not willing to make them sort everything out on their own, especially not when there's a 40 pound size difference between them. That's them in the middle there though. So they obviously manage to sort things out most of the time with our assistance. Once you've done all of these exercises and started to recognize what resources and toys and activities and things you can integrate, you're living life. You're actually cohabitating like a family. That's a good thing. 
just remember that just like the rest of our lives, there will be good periods and bad periods. And it's okay to take a step back or to tighten up on security, whatever you need to do to keep your family safe. And again, it is okay to decide that the things needed to keep your family safe aren't manageable in your daily life and to look at other options out. So that's my presentation today. I really appreciate your being here. What questions do you have for me? Let's head over to the chat and see. So Kerry says, we welcomed a new rescue dog into our one dog home. Our original dog attacked the new dog after five days. Our new rescue is a fearful dog and is now terrified of our other dog. What can we do to help them get along and help our fearful dog come out of her shell? Uh, so this one's going to be tricky just because of the two personalities that you've got going on. But basically the methods that I outlined here will help. It's just going to take a lot longer for you. So you want to be working on your new dog's confidence, uh, food toys, lots of training and things that are going to help build her confidence while building the positive association between the two dogs. So making sure that when they are exposed to each other, they have lots of good, fun things happening, and they're not exposed to each other when you're not ready. You also may want to try something called parallel play, which is essentially having both the learners, whether it be two cats, two dogs, one dog, one cat, or two cats, um, whatever, if you've got each of the animals playing near each other, but not interacting with each other, they can start to learn that good things happen when the other animal is around. So the video, if you think back to um, the little tripod, Jack Russell and the little pit bull, that was a version of parallel play where both of them are playing the game at the same time, but they're not playing with each other at all. So that may be something to help you try as well. Teresa says, we tried the CCC relaxation thing before, but it sounds like we used treats that were too high value. It was very stimulating for the pups. Yeah, you wanna make sure that you're in a nice, quiet, calm environment in the beginning and as boring as you can make it essentially. So um, again, things like Charlie Bears, dry milk bones, um, even I've had clients use carrots or, or um, fruit and vegetables that are obviously dog safe that the dog likes, will eat, but isn't excited by in any way. And when you have a dog who's very food motivated, that can be tricky, but it, it's just a matter of looking around and finding the right thing. I uh, have a question here. What's the difference between luring and cueing? Um, lots. <laughs> Luring is when you use food or something that the dog wants. Um, I'm saying dog, it could be any learner. You use that to coax them into position. Um, for example, if I'm going to lure a down, I would take a treat and hold it near the animal's nose so that they can get the smell and then slowly bring my hand down and their nose should follow and they will uh, eventually end up in a down. That's a lure into a down, just like a fishing lure lures the fish to the hook. I assume I'm not really a fisherman, so that was probably not a great metaphor for me to use, but it's the same concept. Cueing is, is what you're doing to ask the cue. It's um, to ask for the behavior. It's sort of a nicer way of saying command. So um, trainers used to say the command to put your butt on the ground is sit and now the cue is sit. And it's sort of a nicer way of saying, rather than I demand the behavior, I'm going to request the behavior, but the cue is what makes them do it. So a lot of dogs have a cue for jumping up and down frantically. And that's when the owner takes the leash off of the leash hook. That's not an intentional cue probably, but it's something that tells the dog what's gonna happen next and how they should be acting in response. Uh, how do I encourage quiet play rather than barking at each other? This is how they try to get the other to chase them. Um, if you don't want that to be how they play with each other, then as soon as you see that behavior start, you need to calmly separate them from each other and practice more of that relaxation so that just the other animal being around isn't in and of itself stimulating. So 
um, more of that relaxation protocol, more practice with the other moving and one staying in relaxation. And as soon as you see that sort of flirty body language that says, I'm about to start barking at you, you can distract them and interact with them in other ways. How should I handle bringing two dogs back together after a surgery like a spay? Uh, it's super common for dogs, especially who've been overnight in a vet office. Um, cats are very guilty of this as well. I believe the animal smells differently and that can cause some behavior change. Um, so basically, if you see a problem, you want to start right away with separating the animals if you need to, doing that relaxation, doing the anytime they do see each other, they get a treat or some other goodie so that they have those positive experiences with each other. Generally, that issue where um, the behavior has changed drastically after a return from something like surgery tends to be fairly short lived, just a, a couple of days, if that long. Um, so just be sort of proactive and separate them and, and give them that positive association with seeing the other animal again. Sarah asks if we're quietly marking as we reward in the relaxation protocol. No, we're not actually. Uh, you, you can and often humans want to, but the fact of the matter is the food is very significant and often more interaction than called for can raise excitement further. So I don't necessarily want to be saying, yes, good job, and things that have a um, past of being excitable words. I want to instead just say, oh, you did the right thing. There's some food and not, not really mention it or draw attention to it. Just let the animal find it on its own. What is the best way to respond to our dog when she snaps or growls at our other dog over food or getting near us on the couch? We do try to avoid these situations with management. So great start. Management is always the first place to go. Um, as I said, resource guarding is super, super natural. So uh, you want to acknowledge that it's okay and see if we can come up with a more realistic way to manage these things. So um, when she's snapping or growling at another dog over food, my dogs don't have to share food. If they have problems with that, I would separate them when they're eating and keep that from being a manner of concern when the one dog is snapping. Now, getting near us on the couch, the dog doesn't get the right to say who I give affection to. So as with any actual resource guarding protocol that's not just management, what we're gonna do is try and change the way the animal feels and say instead, hey, when mom is petting dog A, dog B gets extra special treats, um, maybe chicken tossed to them, maybe a special Kong or Chewy or something like that, so that it is better for them to let mom hug dog B Dog A, I've gotten them all confused now, but I think you understand. Uh, so that the idea is good things happen over here, good things happen over there, and it's fine. It's not about forcing a share. It's about changing the way the animals feel about that experience. Eileen wants to know if these practices and training will work with dogs of all ages. They absolutely will. Uh, the, the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, not true. Um, just like with people, we learn the most advanced things in college and not in kindergarten. And uh, the, the difference between training someone older and training someone newer is you are often unlearning previous experiences, but not that you cannot learn new ones. So yes, absolutely, uh, all ages. And I tried to give my advice that uh, works with all physical as ability as well. How do you balance treats with meals? Great question, Marie. Um, factor it in, just keep that in mind. I tend to lean towards relatively healthy treats. I tend to go for real meats, um, real cheeses. They tend to be higher value for the dogs anyway. But that said, I'm not gonna factor those in as long-term nutritional value for the animals, but I will factor it in for their daily ration of calories. And what that means is if I'm doing long training sessions, then I might just say, you know what? We trained for an hour. I think an hour of ham equals one or maybe even both of your meals for the day. 
I can also use their actual food as training rewards, especially for something like the relaxation protocol, where I don't want them to be super excited about the food, then it's really easy to just use something that I've got on hand. And I will frequently tell clients, if you are going to practice this five times a day, portion out their meals into five little bowls and just, okay, bowls empty. That's how we know we're done that exercise. Um, just like on Thanksgiving, you don't eat three full meals with one of them being Thanksgiving dinner. We tend to uh, eat a little bit to tide us over until the big holiday festive family meal. And the same thing goes with our dogs and cats and training treats. You just factor it into their daily calories and know that it is not a lasting share of their nutritional value, but that one or two days off of nutritional value is just fine for most animals. Jeff wants to know, what do you do with a new dog that is six months old and a cat that we've had for over two years? Puppy plus adult cat. Um, I'm gonna guess that cat did not get any say in whether or not you got a puppy. And that's okay, <laughs> but um, you're probably gonna have a little bit of a cranky cat. And honestly, that's probably a better setup because um, probably the cat's gonna sort of kick the puppy's butt once or twice and everything will be fine. However, you do wanna make sure that the dog is learning that um, we don't jump on cats. We don't use our mouth in playing with cats. Um, how to back off. I will frequently teach my dogs um, cat hissing, cat swatting, things like that are actually a cue to turn around and come find me. And you just do that by whenever the cat does that, you call the dog and reward them heavily for that. Um, they will soon start to learn that it pays a whole lot better to leave the cat alone when they make those sorts of noises than to continue playing. Um, it can be really tricky with a young puppy and a mature cat because as I mentioned earlier, cat play, if they're actually playing, they're fairly quiet. Um, dogs hear growling and don't necessarily back down because it could be play, it could be um, not play. And so it can be really tricky with a puppy learning to navigate that. But basically you're working with the dog here and making sure that the dog learns how to be more appropriate with the older cat and make sure you give that cat lots of breaks from puppiness because that can be challenging. It's challenging for all of us to deal with puppies. Corinne asks, if growling starts between two dogs, how do you de-escalate the situation without setting off a fight? I love this question, Corinne. Um, call them away cheerfully. You want to have um, something fun for them to do. So, oh, somebody growled. Okay, let's go this way. Oh, good. Here, lots of treats this way. Um, there's a great video that you can find online called One Great Snark. I recommend it to a lot of my clients. In that video, it goes in slow motion and you can see someone tighten a leash on a dog and that's when there's a snark. So you want to use as little physical uh, intervention as possible and cheerfully call them away and break them up. You can scatter food. I often say no dog in the history of ever has been made more angry by being hit in the head with, um, with sausage or food or anything like that. So if you feel like something's about to happen, shower them with a handful of high value treats if you can, but calling them away cheerfully as quickly as possible is going to be your best bet to keep it from escalating further. Eve asked, is the down training meant for a cat? I doubt it. It can be, absolutely. Yeah, it's different body language, but only just. And again, with the, um, with the things that you're rewarding, you're rewarding relaxed behaviors. So you're looking at things like yawns, um, grooming, slow blinks, uh, relaxed behaviors, change in the tail, um, things like that. So while it's not as clearly a doggy sphinx down, you are still re um, reinforcing that relaxed behavior and absolutely can do it with cats as well. Yes. Karen, my question, any advice for curbing pack mentality, i.e. getting the dogs to listen when they're operating as a pack? 
I have a pack of nine large dogs raising, ranging in age from five months to 12 years individually or even in groups of two or three. They're generally well-behaved and will listen to commands. When they're all together focusing on a singular activity like catching a mouse, they will not listen. They tear my house apart trying to catch a mouse. I figure out which dog is dominant in the activity and get a leash on that dog and pull, pull him or her away first and so on until the rest disperse. This works, but is a relatively slow process. I'd appreciate other suggestions. Lot to unpack there, Karen. Um, it is very, very tricky once you get multiple dogs behaving in any kind of group mentality like that. The best thing you could do to pull them away from activity that you don't want them all engaging in is teach individually each one a really rock solid recall. Um, I would make it the same recall for each animal and just really being very, very solid and um, consistent that that recall pays really, really well every single time. You need to start it individually. So each dog is very good with it individually and then gradually build up to being able to do it with nine dogs. Um, Cause yeah, it's, it is very different uh, getting them to respond to that many behavior requests when there's so much other distraction and instinct and, and that kind of thing going on. Um, yeah, I, I think a recall is probably gonna be your best bet other than just navigating who can play with who and, and that sort of thing. I think that's all the questions I have. Um, I did get a couple in there twice, so hopefully I didn't miss anyone. Thank you all very much for being here. I had a lot of fun despite our, our few little technical glitches here or there. If I didn't get to your question or if you need more clarification or anything along those lines, please feel free to reach out to me below info at oscarwinningbehavior.com. Everything's spelled traditional American way. So no you in behavior. Info at oscarwinningbehavior.com. I'm Amy Glasgow. It was great to be here with you all today. And thank you again to Your Dog's Friend for having me. Bye-bye.